Okay, chapter 13 for Staying Fat for Sarah Burns. For the past three days, Sarah Burns has been living in the apartment above Lemery's garage. She bolted from the psych ward within 24 hours after the attendants heard her speak. I went up to the ward to tell Laurel, her counselor, that Sarah Burns was okay, but that there were good reasons for her not wanting anyone to know where she was. It's your father, isn't it? Laurel asked. Sarah Burns had told me not to tell Laurel anything about her dad because she'd be required to report to Child Protection Services. If they started questioning her dad, he'd get cranked up and come looking for her, which he'll do anyway, but maybe with a little less zeal. I said, I stand on the fifth. She smiled. I'm just glad to know she's safe, Eric. Thanks. Getting Sarah Burns to stay at Lemry's place was easier than I thought it would be. She left the psych ward, still majorly pissed at me for telling Lemry about her dad. She kicked me out of the hospital right after she blew her cover, but met me in the parking lot the next afternoon, less than half an hour after she called demanding that I get my ass down there, because she wasn't going to take the chance of the staff getting worried about liability and telling her father she had talked. She slammed down the phone before I could tell her my mom's car wasn't there. So I called Ellerby, but his phone was busy. I ran the mile and a half from my house to Sacred Heart, worried Sarah Burns would get to the parking lot, find no one waiting, and take off in a huff. Sarah Burns had no sweat getting out. She simply stuffed her things into a bag, waited until no one was looking, and walked out a back way to the parking lot. I was waiting at the corner telephone booth where I'd finally contacted Ellerby only seconds earlier. I told him to hurry. Call you a cab, ma'am. I said. She said, don't mess with me, Eric. Just get me out of here. My dad will be here in a few minutes. Be pissed at me if you want, I said. I did the only thing I could. Lemery's still in on this, and she hasn't called child protection. If you can't trust that, then I don't know what. She can just stay the hell away from me, she said. I've had all the help I need to last me for the next five years. Yeah, well, it ain't all the help you're going to get. I said as the cruiser rounded the corner, Ellerby sitting low in the front seat in dark glasses and a broad-brimmed hat. He pulled up beside us, glanced stealthily both ways before leaping out to open the back door. He said, In! Sarah Burns looked at him like he was crazy, then back at me. I shrugged and said, In! A dark car, an older model Oldsmobile with tinted windows, approached from the direction Ellerby had come, and Sarah Burns glanced up in panic, jumped into the back seat, and lay flat. Drive, she said, and it didn't take an astrophysicist to know the ominous form at the wheel was Virgil Burns. He must not have seen me, or known Ellerby's cruiser, because he coasted slowly, seemingly looking for a parking spot. Ellerby dropped into the driver's seat as I slid into shotgun. So where will I be dropping you, miss? He asked. The Sheraton? Marriott? Maybe the Hilton? Excuse me, what was I thinking of? We have no Hilton. Not five dollars off my tip. Drive, Sarah Burns said through gritted teeth. Ellaby pulled slowly onto the street, passing within three feet of Mr. Burns' dark blue monstrosity. That's an ugly car, he said, and gave a short honk as we passed. I turned my head away as Mr. Burns glanced up. You'll think that's real funny, Sarah Burns said, when he finds out you drove the getaway car. In the side view mirror, I watched Mr. Burns walk across the parking lot toward the hospital. In a few minutes, the stakes to this game would go up. So, where to? Ellerby asked again. I glanced over the seat at Sarah Burns and said, to Lemry's house. I expected a protest, like maybe she'd kick the windows out, but she stared straight ahead. She's expecting us, I told Ellerby. Sarah Burns just shook her head in disgust, holding on to her tough act, but seeing her father had rattled her. Shortly after we arrived, Lemery sent Ellerby and me packing. Why don't you guys do whatever it is guys do for a few hours? We'll call if we need you. Sarah Burns appeared unsure, like a cornered animal, but said nothing. I just... I was just glad to get away from her before she got a chance to get me alone and separate my body parts. So, here we sit in the middle of Lemry's class, 
on the first day Sarah Burns has been with us, which is hard to figure because I would think school is the first place her dad will look. I'm surprised he hasn't already. I've had very little chance to talk with Sarah Burns because Lemery told me to leave her alone until she got her bearings. Mots is sitting in today, uninvolved, but leaning against the wall near Lemery's desk like a sentry. I'm thinking this might be a good day to go light on my usual form of class participation. We're into the last installment of the abortion issue. Lemery gave it a few weeks in forced rest to let people calm down. And Mark Britton is well into the same old happy horse shit he uses to scold the world. Ellerby is following my lead of restraint because, even though we wouldn't agree to follow Mott's edict to stay off Britton's case, Lemre told him that when a fool and a wise man argue, it's sometimes hard for those of us on the outside to tell the difference. That shut Ellerby's trap right quick. We sit in a circle, and I'm watching Jody stare at the flat surface of her desk while Britton rambles. Sarah Burns is directly across from us, shifting nervously in her seat in a way I recognize. And if Mark Britton recognized it too, he'd shut the hell up. But Britton's 4.0 grade average includes no A's for insight, and he forges on like a runaway gospel train without Ellerby and me there to throw objects onto his tracks to derail him. It's God's law, he says, that every human must step up and take responsibility for his actions. All life is sacred, and if a woman makes the mistake of fornication and she gets pregnant, she has the moral obligation to bring that child to term. Bring that child to term. Jesus, Britain, you've been watching too many doctor shows. Not everything is about Christianity, Mr. Britain, Lemery says. We've heard that argument about enough, I think. Let's go on. With all respect, Britain says, everything is about Christianity. It's when we believe it isn't that we get into trouble, Lemery sighs. Okay, everything is about Christianity for you, Mark, but there are other perspectives, and I want to hear them. Let's stay with this view just one more minute, says a soft voice. The class looks up in unison to see that it's coming from Sarah Burns. Sarah Burns scoots her desk an inch or so forward, staring directly across the circle at Britain. Are you telling us all life is sacred, that it's all equal? Sarah Burns' intensity visibly pushes Britain back in his seat, but he holds his ground. That's right. You think my life is as sacred as Ms. Lemery's or Mr. Motz's over there, or yours? Of course it is, Britain says, and I detect a note of patronization. That is a big mistake. Sarah Burns slides out of her seat and walks across the room. Her Nikes as silent as moccasins on a hard dirt trail and kneels in front of Britain. Mark looks at the desk. Very softly, she says, Look at me. Britain looks up, but his sight drops immediately back to his desktop. The rest of the class, me included, fidgets. No, Sarah Burns says as softly as before. Keep looking at me. Britton lifts his gaze, and I think I see a drop of sweat form on his forehead. Moss looks at Lemery, but Lemery doesn't move a muscle. Are you saying, Sarah Burns continues, that if you knew you were married to someone who would do this to your baby, she touches her face, you should have that baby anyway? Britton looks confused. He doesn't know the real story behind Sarah Burns' condition. I think, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Sarah Burns sits back in her haunches and sort of smiles, looking across the room at Mr. Motts. Then she leans forward again and puts her hands on Mark's desk. I'll give you one more chance, she says. Are you telling me that a woman who's married to a man she knows will disfigure or kill her baby and who knows she doesn't have the guts to get away from him should have that baby anyway? Britton has regained some composure. We can't make predictions like that, he says. All life is sacred. Everyone deserves a chance. Think you'd like to have my chance? Sarah Burns asks, pointing at her face. It's not something I'd choose, Britton says, but... It's not something I'd choose either, Sarah Burns says quickly. She stands up to walk back to her seat, then turns in the middle of the room. You and Mr. Motts go to the same church, don't you? She asks. 
Burton glances at Maud, who nods imperceptibly. Yeah, Burton says. What's that got to do with? Do all the people in that church think all life is sacred? Britain says, they certainly do. And do they treat people's lives as if they're sacred? Britain feels safe here. Of course they do. Sarah Burns moves a couple more steps toward her desk. I swear to God she's going to grow up and be to be a crispy version of Perry Mason. She whirls and faces Britain. Mark Britain. I've been in the same class as you from first grade on, and I could count the number of times you've spoken to me on an amputee's fingers. I can't even get you to look me in the eye. Are you telling me my life is as sacred to you as Jody Mueller's? I mean, up until Eric the Great aced you out? Britain opens his mouth, but Sarah Burns whirls, and all of a sudden she's running it down Mott's throat. And this man, who goes to the same church you go to, and you know how many decent words, hell, any word, kind of words he's uttered to me in the past six years? Zip. Zero. I have a 3.6 grade point average, for God's sakes. Had a straight 4.0 in junior high, and the best he's been able to do in all the time is chew out my friend for an underground newspaper that was so bizarre, it didn't deserve a minute of his time. He didn't even respect me enough to show me his disgust. He told Eric what to say to me. Maud starts to speak, but she whirls back to Britain. How come you people care so much for the unborn when you don't even give a little bit of a shit for the born? Now Maud breaks in. Ms. Lemery, don't you think this has gone far enough? I'd expect you to have better control of your class. She seems in control to me, Lemery says. You ought to be here on a bad day. But Britain is wounded now, and I think we're about to have a bad day. His face is red, his neck pushing against his collar. Cry babies, he says. Nobody wants to take on the tough stuff. You've been pulling all kinds of stuff since you were a little kid and hiding behind the fact that you were disfigured. I'm tired of all the excuses. Tired of them, you hear? You step up and take your medicine. You should be damn glad you're alive and that God loves you. Jeez, Britain, Ellerby says. Get a grip. Tap your helmet, man. Go to hell, Ellerby. Just go to hell. You're the perfect example of what's wrong. You're, you're worse than she is. You're even worse than Calhoun. You are evil. Mm -hmm. Lemery looks over to Mott. Now it's out of hand, she says quietly. Okay, class. Let's give it a rest. Britton turns to fire on her, but Jody steps in as he opens his mouth and says, Mark Britton, shut your mouth. Britton stops in mid-sentence like somebody filled his mouth with a bomb. I've heard your self-righteous BS for the last time. I really believed that you were special for a while there, but you just make me sick. You better shut up. She turns to the rest of the class. Man is known by his works. I've heard that enough out of Mark Britton's mouth so many times that I thought he made it up. But let me tell you about Mark Britton's works. A little less than a year ago, I had a six week old fetus inside me. Mark Britton's and my works. Tears form at the edges of her eyes. I move my chair close to Jody's and she takes my hand. I wanted to keep it. He said no. I said I'd go away to have it. That's how desperate I was, how awful I felt about what I'd done. And you know what he said? Y you know what he said? He said he could never do the work he needed to do in the world with an illegitimate child hanging over his head. He said I'd have to get rid of it. That's a lie, Britton yells. You, you bitch. Mueller, I, I knew you'd try to slander me when I dumped you. Jody doesn't miss a beat. I asked him about the church's stand on abortion, and he told me that what he had to say to the world was more important than one error in judgment. An error in judgment, that's what he called it. He said making love to someone who didn't have the common sense to protect herself was nothing more than that. He didn't call it fornication then. He called it an error in judgment. And you know what I did? I had the abortion. That's how screwed up I was. And I had it alone because Mark Britton couldn't be seen at the clinic. I had to cross lines I'd marched in to have an abortion alone. She turns to Mark. I don't know right or wrong about sacred life, Mark Britton, but I know this. You don't talk to Sarah Burns that way. You just don't. And you don't talk to me that way either. Not ever again. 
Having gathered his books, Britton stops at the door. What you all just heard out of Jody Mueller's mouth is a filthy lie. It's just one more example of what happens when you try to take the high road. You can believe it if you want to, but it's a filthy lie. Well, Ellerby says, I won't be doing my report on shame. I could never top that. Chapter 13 Analysis. Uh, this chapter is uh, a bombshell, I think is the best way to describe it. Um, we have a couple of major events. Major event number one, uh, Sarah's out of the um, the hospital and she's staying at Lemery's house and bam, it was kind of fast. I mean, I don't know about you, but reading it, you're like, man, I thought that would be harder or take longer or be more involved, but it was like, bam, and she's there. Um, number two, we have the cat class and wow. Okay. Um, this is an interesting thing because um, you know, you talk about um, very similitude. Very similitude is whether or not something is believable. If it has a lot of very similitude, it would be very believable. If it had low very similitude, it would be not believable, hard to believe. This is one of those areas where um, it's hard for me to believe as a teacher that this kind of class would exist, number one or that um, it would be run in this particular way. This is very loose and this is very um, contentious. This is this is a it's kind of a off the rails kind of thing. It makes for a good story. It's very interesting to read. But, you know, as a teacher, I don't think I could have a class where uh, kids had these kinds of discussions or went after each other in this kind of way. Um, you know, I know that our school has a lot of um, support classes. There's peer mediation. Um, we have a lot of supports with counselors and things like that. But if something like this came up, my first thing wouldn't be to just run a normal class and just, oh, settle down, kids. I would stop it and I would bring in administrators and counselors and maybe peer mediators and try to do some different things. Um, it, this to me is not incredibly realistic. That aside, it's very interesting. If we stick to the story, Sarah's talking about what happened to her openly. Uh, she's talking about it to a group of kids. And so that shows that she's kind of moving on with um, how she sees herself. Uh, maybe maybe she's, she's moving forward. Um, it's a possibility. Um, additionally, we have a couple of things that are, are into the mix here. She's now got Mott's kind of story in the pot, and we got to wonder what's going to go on with that. And they sort of set the trap and, and foreshadow that her father, Virgil Burns, well, this is just the start of it, right? Um, he's going to go to that hospital. He was there, just missed her. Um, he's going to know that she's not there anymore, and then he's going to want to find her. And that's all hanging over the the sort of... The story right now we're wondering when is he coming and what's it gonna look like and now we have to wonder what's going on with mark I mean he, boy this is really kind of pushed him to the brink um, and as mrs. Lemery has said Ms. Lemery um, he's wound very tightly he has no sense of humor this could be um, very difficult for him to handle uh, in a positive way or in any way whatsoever and so that's where we're at we've got uh, seven chapters left and uh, hopefully, hopefully you're enjoying this. <laughs>